You are listening to the Mary Jane Society podcast, where you will meet entrepreneurs, cultivators, scientists, doctors, and inventors in the cannabis industry. I'm your host, Pam Schmiel, marketer and publicist in the cannabis industry. Today, our guest is Robert Head. He served over five years in the Army, including on the front lines of Iraq. In 2016, he entered the cannabis industry and bought a farm in Maine to cultivate cannabis. Robert has also devoted his time to helping communities understand that cannabis plays a big role in the veterans' healing process. And in late 2022, he and another veteran, Todd Scatini, founded Hemp for Victory a nonprofit that is bringing attention to the need for plant medicine to heal our veterans. Let's meet Robert. That it would be great for um, you just to give us an overview of what Hemp for Victory is. So we're a 501c3 and our focus is conversations about cannabis and, and veteran community. And so when we when we originally decided to do this, I've been in this industry for nine years now, and I started uh, started in by just creating my own farm. I had discovered how cannabis really helped me get off a lot of medication and alcohol that I was on. And like so many vets, when they when they get out, um, they're normally in their late twenties, right? Mm-hmm. And so when they do get out, sometimes they have a lot more issues than the normal twenty year olds were going to have, like physical issues, right? It could be mental, it could be physical. Um, they may have hurt themselves while they were in. And so now they get out and they go to the doctor and the doctor prescribes them one or two little pills to kind of help them deal with it. But the problem is those pills have a lot of the negative reactions to them that later on develop other comorbidities that a person will have to continue to, to get prescribed pills. So then they go on to this pharmacology route that winds up destroying their lives down the road. And when I say down the road, we're talking 10, 20 years of this is just accumulation. You know, I've met people who are on uh, on Ambien and they've been on Ambien for 10 years. <laughs> That's not supposed to happen. You cannot be on Ambien for 10 years, but people are. And right. I thought it causes dementia. I mean, it, I don't know. But it's it so, does. And there's. Yeah. And that's that, that's another thing too. It, it's it's the problems that these medications are are causing. And now, you know, you you look at it and it's spiraled out of control. We have a spider web of all these different issues we're having to control. So when I when for veterans, um, over the years, as I had I had my cannabis company and we uh, grew some uh, cannabis up in Maine, and we were a veteran led group there and I had a friend of mine that I started with he and I started it and we closed it down and I really stayed in the activist role I live in Texas so it's very hard for vets to get access down here we have a cannabis program but it's very limited and it was really based and developed to fail so that they so that the Republican Party could say hey look we tried but it failed the people didn't want it that's that was the design of it and mm. The problem is, is that they're not, you know, you get the GOP, you have the Democrats that are using this this plant medicine as a political volley to go back and forth to get voters. And that's all it is. But the reality, yeah. the majority of everybody says that they agree with it. it needs to be legalized, especially medicinally, right across the board. And uh, as we know, this growing uh, acceptance for cannabis in the veteran community, it's much higher, much higher. In the veteran community, 80 plus percentage agree that it needs to be uh, legalized, recreational, and 90 plus percent believe it needs to be medical. And the large reason for that is, is that even though a person may not even be using cannabis as a vet, they've served and gone to combat because we've been in war for 20 years. They all have buddies who are veterans who've served in combat that majority of them do use it, and they understand that. So... Fast forward from night from 2016 when I first got in 2000 uh, yeah 2016 when I first got in you fast forward and it's 2021 and uh, in the midst of a pandemic mm. a friend of mine named Todd Scatini he's a West Point graduate contacts me and says hey I'm, West Point is playing the Air Force Academy down in Arlington Stadium in Texas and we thought about having a mixer between the two. And we would invite all the uh, alumni from those universities to talk about cannabis and just have a mixer. And that's basically what it was. We had like 400 people show up. These were, you know, 
uh, generals, uh, field grade officers, uh, colonels, and graduates from an, yeah, graduates from Na Annapolis, graduates from West Point, graduates from the Air Force Academy Coast Guard, young officers that were like lieutenants that just got to that said they had to sneak in. They didn't want anybody else to know they were there, but they wanted to have questions. And what this uh, what this showed was that there was a dire need for leadership to stand up and speak on this. And in order for that to happen, we needed to construct some kind of organization. So Hemp for Victory was born from that. Hemp for Victory, the term Hemp for Victory, was an actual World War II initiation that created a, uh, a license for hemp for farmers to grow because they needed it for the war efforts. Because a lot of the, 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 the Japanese had blocked off a lot of the supply routes that they were using for fiber that would, you know, for... Uh, canvas and, and uh, tents and, and things of that nature. So they reinstituted hemp, allowing for people to grow and use that uh, that fiber for uh, the war needs here in, in the United States. Uh, so we took that because we have another issue. We have another big issue. We have veterans who are dying left and right. I know we hear about the 2020, uh, the 22 a day, and um, that survey and how we came up with that number was, it wasn't we, I should make sure I say this properly, it wasn't me, it was, I believe, uh, another VSO organization, I want to say it was either DAV or IVE or something of that nature, and they did 1,500 uh, veterans, and I believe that was the, the pool, it was pretty small. And that's where they came up with the 22 a day, but they were only looking at combat veterans, those that are deployed. So the, the actual number, when they reevaluated that and they found out it was so high, they did another assessment that was done through Bayer Medicine and something in another group. And I, uh, I apologize to the group. I can't remember right now, but I can look them yeah. up. Come to find out if you, when you reorganize the, the, um, research and you start and you say let's have our base instead of being combat vets we'll have former service members that who those who served during their period of time whether they deployed or they didn't deploy and let's look at that number using the same metrics and it was 44 a day so what we find out is that you know it's not just combat vets right like like myself and some of some of the other guys it's it's people who just join to serve. You don't have any choice about where you go once you get in, right? That's up to the politicians. We're just the fighting force. And so these groups go out and they may not even deploy and they come back, but they're still going to have issues. They can have issues in training. They can hurt them. They can have issues just while training goes on. You can get hurt. There's sexual assault. There's all sorts of things that can happen during that period of time that they're serving their country. Now, whether they go anywhere, that's really going to be more so up to the politicians. But when they get out, what we're seeing is a uh, a big issue with pills and bad and bad medicine. And the VA does not want to acknowledge holistic medicine, largely to do with the fact that it is Schedule One and they can't. And there's also happened the fact that there's people who don't want marijuana and and psychedelics to go off schedule one. Psychedelics has a better chance than cannabis, but cannabis just has such a bad history because of the misunderstanding of his, of, of cannabis, right? Right. So the VA is uh, adamantly against the legalization of cannabis. At the same time, they do understand they need to do research, and all the veterans for our service organizations we call them VSOs, are starting to gather and come together over this topic. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really important. Yeah, so where, okay, wow. I know, there's so much. Um, yeah. How has uh, marijuana helped, you know, vets as far as like- It's really all of it. And so when we think about cannabis and we talk about, uh, you know, how you consume it, right? Yeah. It's con considered a delivery system. And so we ask ourselves from the plant to the body, how does it get delivered into our body? Now, a lot of us, especially as old school Gen X guys, we like to pack a bowl and go outside, roll a joint, go outside. We're bong bowl guys, right? That's fine. Mm -hmm. We see that the newer generation tends to lead more towards vape pens, uh, what we call dabbing things of that nature. And even further on, we're seeing gummies and, and it all depends on what it is that the person has. I know guys that use smoke uh, for pain and just irritability. And it, yeah. they, it just kind of throughout the day, they go do it privately and it allows yeah. them to kind of make it through the day. I know other guys that don't like to smoke because they just don't like, they don't like smoking. They don't right. 
yeah. flavor. They don't like the smell, and but they do like the effects. That will go with tinctures or gummies or something else. There's many different ways to do it, but what I've noticed is that vets um, tend to find it therapeutic, mm -hmm. just in the in in the process of taking the medicine, right? Packing your bowl, going outside, being alone, having your coffee, having that meditation time. It's extremely important. It's all part of the medicine. Some of the guys, um, it really just, like I said, it will depend on what kind of issues they have and how they feel like handling. The thing that I think people need to understand about cannabis and, and what we do when we talk about it from hemp for victory, we talk it from the cannabinoid effect. We don't talk about it from the aspect of marijuana or a CBD or a joint or a, T, a Delta eight joint. Or we don't look at it from that perspective because that is irrelevant. Once it gets into your body, what's what we're concerned about right so if uh if we talk about how cannabinoids react to the body and that we show that the that cbd receptors and the thc receptors are all working together and we see a reduction in pills that's what that's what we notice and that's what we talk about why do we see this reduction in pills when veterans are using it why are veterans 60 percent more likely to use cannabis over the general public well we also yeah. see a massive pill well, reduction uh, they're able to contact and talk back and forth with their family members more uh, more often. They're not drunk all the time. They don't have hangovers all the time. They're losing weight. They're getting back into shape. Um, and a lot of people don't associate that with cannabis because the fear of the munchies and laziness and everything else. And I think something that people have to understand is that the drug does not make you lazy. That laziness is instilled into the person. It's not instilled into the drug. The drug has effects that if you're a lazy person, may not be a good thing for you to use. Mm -hmm. If you're not a lazy person, may be a good thing for you to use because you can do more. It's a perspective of, of the drug and our relationship with these drugs that we need to understand. If we try to take it from a perspective of the drug does X, Y, and Z to us, but it doesn't, we'll continuously always ban these drugs and never know, know really how to use them. So it's important that when we talk to people, we talk about the cannabinoids, what it is that you're taking, right? If we know that CBD receptors, we tell you how that helps with pain and inflammation and problems with the gut, then uh, people will start looking at tinctures and, and things that to help alleviate that problem, you know, and, and yeah. that's it. Yep. Yeah. And I was going to say, and of course, um, what I, I think that organizations like yours is doing is, um, is putting more light on the need for research into these different cannabinoids because there's so much more, you know, so much we don't know about all those minor cannabinoids and how they might really target and be more precision medicine to deal with what, you know, the problems that the vets are having. Um, so I, I, I just really believe that, you know, organizations like this, uh, it, it makes the movement of legalization stronger because they are a service people, you know, men and women. And, you know, it's for, it's not only just for the general public, but this is for supporting, you know, people who went out into the front lines or, or even joined the service, you know, it, mm -hmm. it's, I mean. Correct. And our organization is not member led, we're, we're board led. And the reason for that is, is because there's a lot of VSOs out there that are already member led and they're wonderful VSOs. And I don't think we should be taking from that. I think that those VSOs need all the support like Balanced Veterans Network, is a great example. We work alongside them. I do not want to be in competition with membership on them. Well, we are a, we are a voice for the VSOs. We help yeah. bring legitimacy to this argument. You know, yeah. we have Dr. Corey Birchman, whom you know. Dr. Birchman's wonderful. In fact, he's the one who wrote uh, President Biden's argument to the HHS on on the scientific evidence that cannabis is, shouldn't be on Schedule One. Right now, we've been part of this movement since last August. And we've been uh, sending uh, letters to President Biden and the Congress with other VSO organizations. So we do a lot of work on in that regard. It's a lot of pressure from underground. We don't do a lot of social media pressure. Our pressure comes from, from different organizations. We work with the American Legion and Hemp for Victory and so there are other organizations that are starting to, to kind of pull together. We're all coming together to talk about how cannabis and psychedelics needs to be researched from the VA. And the reason is, is because there's so many different cannabinoids. And when it's on schedule one, you can't do the research that you really should be able to do. 
And if we could think about taking a holistic plant that people can kind of grow in their own backyard, it would save a lot of people money. It would save a lot of lives. But the healthcare industry in which in America is not interested in saving lives. It's interested in cycling people through a system, right? And that system pays dividends on multiple levels, right? From like pharmaceutical companies. Yeah. And then afterwards, they got a death tag. What the fuck is that all about? But the thing that I think that people should understand about cannabis is that it allows a person to take control of their health. It's a tool. And if you really try to work at it and you get yourself into shape and you start eating right and you start feeling better and you use this medicine, all of a sudden you realize how, realize how free you actually are because you're yeah. not confined to medication that's processed by a company that may go under, may not go under, and then you got to research it again and your costs are going up. And then also with people in the service, like you said, they, you know, they go in young usually, and then they, they might've been smoking and had a dealer, you know, wherever everybody got it when they're younger. And I mean, it's forbidden, obviously, you know, I don't know what happens if you get caught with it in the service, but. A lot of that depends on, on, this is a good question. And I want to start off by saying this to, to all your listeners out there. If you're a veteran, you can use cannabis. They will not take your benefits. They will not do it. Oh, okay. They will not take your benefits. They okay. will not do it. Um, I mean, if you get busted for for taking 20 pounds across state lines, I can't help you on that. But if you're just, you know, if you have an ounce of weed and you're smoking in your house and you're, you know, you buy it from a, from a guy and that's how you get it, they're not going to take it away from you. Okay. The reason for that is that there's so many states and the, the uh, military right now is having a retention problem. The retention problem is multiple things. One of those issues is cannabis. I don't know the number that it affects on the retention, but I will tell you right now that they are 60% below or some of that. Age. It's a big number that they have not reached their retention yet. 98% of the uh, men and women that are eligible to be in the military physically, they can physically get into the military, have the aptitude and everything else. Of those 98%, they all of uh, all those women, nine men and women, 98 percent of them live in an area where they can access legal CBD or cannabis oh, yeah. on the state level, but it will be illegal for the federal level. So we'll make them ineligible for for service. Now, when you go in, you obviously have to take a, you know, a year analysis and they go through and they ask you everything. I mean, when I went in, I went into the infantry and I had to do some stuff for for uh, a secret operations and things of that nature. They would ask you all these kind of like secret questions. Like, have you ever done marijuana? And I was like, no, I didn't. No, if you're lying to you, go to jail. I'm like, no, you're not. You're not sending me to jail for smoking weed. Dude. What the fuck? <laughs> this was in 1990. Uh, this was in, ninth, in 2001, right? You know, I joined right before 9-11. Uh, marijuana was pretty was something that uh, they were dead set against and if you get caught while you're in the military the best case scenario for you is what we call 45 45 article 15 and what that is article 15 is um, basically a punishment by the by military code of justice uniform military uniform military code of justice now in that if you get busted for weed they're supposed to kick you out if you pop hot this is if you pop hot, not if they catch you with it. This is if you pop hot. Your best case scenario is called 45, 40, 45 days of pay cut and 45 days of hard labor. And you get you get your, your loss in rank. It's a shame, too, because the military offers people a great way to, A, get yourself educated, get yourself a craft. Yes. You can learn a good trade, get out get your college paid for. There's a yes. lot of benefits of being in the military. I prefer us being in the military during peacetime, but there's a lot of <laughs> benefits of being yeah. in the military that if they can change something like this, you're really taking kids that could go into the streets and be nothing but shitheads. Or you can maybe say, listen, we don't care about the marijuana part. Bring them in and you can train them up. Because I'm telling you, some of these kids that came into my units, I thought to myself, I was like, there's no way this kid's going to do anything good in life talk about the cycle of poverty or just people not being able to get up and get themselves educated i i never you know it, it's it's that is a really good point um, you're denying person a career that can i mean they're physically able to do it and they're mentally able to to do it there's there's no reason why they shouldn't be able to come in and it's a win-win the, the mm -hmm. you know the 
the we as American citizens win by having someone join the arm, you know, or the service, and they win by getting an education. It's it's so obvious to me. I, it's 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 really a shame. It is a shame. I think going from Schedule One to Schedule Three will help. We've had some discussions with military leadership and the DoD and certain bases, and some one of the biggest things they it's something they don't want to talk about it. It's that the Schedule One confines them in bureaucratic law that will not allow them to talk about it. So once it starts to change and that implication goes into effect, you're going to see conversations open up. And, I, and I'm going to tell you, I have two good examples of this. One example is of an organization we talked to when we were in Fort Leonard Wood. I'm not allowed to say the name of it, but we were talking to them up in Fort Leonard Wood. And um, which was an amazing place. Such a great amount of history is there for the military, especially in the army. Mm. So we were there with our military guys, right? Dr. Birchman and Todd Scatini, Lieutenant Colonels and, and uh, officers. And we're talking to some very impressive people. And the first thing out of their mouth is like, man, I get it. I understand what you're talking about. We like the idea of the industrial aspect. We like the, you know, the medical thing. We're like, we're, we're getting on board. We want to learn more about it. But until it is off schedule one, these generals are not going to come talk to you about it, mm -hmm. right? And we're talking four stars and three star generals that they don't, they're not going to come talk to you about this. We can't even get in, we can't get in front of the people at the Pentagon because it's on schedule one. Mm -hmm. Once that drops, these organizations, like the one that I just tell, told you about at Fort Leavenworth, will open up. Additionally, that's the DOD, okay? That's a, that is one separate thing compared to the rest of the world. The DOD just works on its own. We have our own mentality. For the civilian world, I was talking with the DFW hospital complex, right? Now, DFW hospital, it's not the DFW hospital complex, it's the DFW hospital uh, council, that's what it is. And basically, it's an accumulation of all the hospitals in the DFW area. And to give you an idea of how big the DFW area, think of Rhode Island. We're that big. Mm. Right. We're just two cities and, and, two, and there's a combination of all these other cities. It's called the Metroplex and it's massive. And there's about five million people in that area. It's huge. So there's a lot of hospitals. Baylor, Methodist. Well, they had uh, I was sitting there and I was talking with the CEO of all these hospitals and they're not in disagreements about mar medical marijuana. Most of them, they think it's great. Their concern is, how do I use this in my system? And we bring subject matter experts to help them talk this out and so that we can help devise plans for them to be able to institute how do we take a cannabis as a medicine and institute it into a hospital with all these SOPs and guidelines that we need to be a, a, to go by without losing funding, right? That's an important yeah. part of it. People don't realize how complicated that actually is. And so they want to know more about that. But it's Schedule 1 and we can't have that discussion, right? So getting yeah. it off schedule one opens these discussions to be able to find out how to use them. Because the truth of the matter is, these people want to be able to say that they can save people money. They, the, the guy I was telling me, like, I believe that cannabis could really save people a lot of money. Like how many pills they don't have to take. Oh, yeah. And, and so there's a want out there, but there are roadblocks, massive roadblocks that keep these conversations from happening. And remember, that's what we do. Our whole focus and our whole mission is to have these conversations to show that our veterans are going to take a more holistic approach to their health once they get out. And in order right. to do that, you've got to create an environment around that. And you have to pull down roadblocks to do that. It's very difficult. It's a marathon of a run. First, if if we do go to schedule three, will that open that'll open up conversations, like make the generals, those top people that you want to out be out there standing up, that'll just say that they won't get any backlash for that. That really opens them yeah, up. They, they won't, it, it'll be fine. But at that point, um we would be doing a lot of traveling into these these organizations and setting up summits and and, and uh, seminars to educate. Uh, the DOD and, and other organizations on that in order to get that done. You know, one of the things we wanted to do is try to do VA um, health care classes and things of that nature. And that's very difficult to kind of get into because there's a lot of loopholes. It's not just that it's schedule one, but there's, there's other loopholes to get into it. Right. And what we would see is that we would start having more discussions on it. And I think that's where it would be really important. We work alongside 
other universities. And we try to uh, build, by making these connections, we're helping people solve problems, right? By these, uh, through use through this network. And then we hope to do the same thing with, uh, with education. And so we bring in people that are on our board that are very specialized in government and, and uh, how these things come about, right? You can't just say, I'm going to have this discussion. You need to have the ne proper network. And so we develop that network. And that's uh, this is what we're going to do. So for the next six months, our focus will be working with other VSOs to, uh, to help promote the VA and psychedelics and, and cannabis research, which is going to be a very big thing. Yeah. So, Step so two is we're going to be working on letters to go towards Congress, and we'll be bringing in VSOs. So, if you if you have a VSO out there, small or large, doesn't even have to be anything to do with cannabis. But if you believe that cannabis should be legalized, uh, then definitely get a hold of me. And then the the fourth thing is, or the, excuse me, the third thing that we're going to probably do right now is we're collecting our our network together to put on summits and and other organizations to work with other organizations to put on. Uh, panels and discussions where people can you know openly ask questions a lot of times we'll probably do it with universities because yeah. our focus is to have it have these conversations not with the grassroots because that's who we have behind us but with the leadership in industries that are, will make the decisions on whether yay or nay this will go forward so that's I mean, really who we focus on and doctors i mean doctors need to be educated and the, and the edu you know and the education needs to be to be there because they're so you know doctors and nurses because they're so busy everybody's so busy but for, for to kind of just simplify it and just educate them on the basics and what could be the possibilities seems to me like if you went into the va hospitals and did seminars is that kind of what you're saying too is you're planning on going in there to educate doctors and I feel like you're preaching to the choir as far as the service people right you They're definitely like, are so it's not for the service people but the service yeah. people should be able to come and, and show, oh, show up and ask questions yeah. a lot of what we'll do is that we'll have these uh seminars with other organizations outside like an example would be the American Healthcare uh executives organization right that's here in Dallas but they're spread all across the United States well, we can put on a panel about cannabis and medicine and answer certain questions, talk about PTSD, talk about opioids and have separate panels for people to come to now that it's kind of open. And then what you do is you, you send those out and they give you credit for your CMAs, right? So that allows oh, yes, you to have yes. continuing oh, education yes. and you offer yes. that. But you allow it open to anybody else. But if you want the CMA, Yes, you that credit, you're going to have to pay for it. But if you want to go there and listen and ask questions, then, then that's probably something else. So those are things that we would we would work on. There's organizations that we work with to help help out with that. So, for example, um, there's a group here called the American Healthcare for um, American College for Healthcare Executives. And they put on um, CMAs all the time for all different topics. So when it comes into cannabis, they come to us. And then we bring in the material and we put on the panel and that, that way that they can get that CMA. I see. Uh, but we bring in qualified people. To right. Do it. You have to have a, lot, a pretty good, ex, you know, extensive credentials. Uh, not all, all of our board members are veterans, but our subject matter experts are ranged from everybody. So right. uh, they don't even have to be a, to be a veteran. You just need to have good credentials. Next step, going to schedule three, obviously is descheduling. But, but remember, when we talk about the scheduling process here, this is only under the executive branch. This does not have anything to do with legality of the, of the plan, right? When we talk about the legality of the plan, making it legal and access to it, it needs to go through Congress, right? So that's going to be your next step. You got to get executive branch of bureaucracies to somewhat approve that there's medical value. And then you're going to have to have that, that pressure coming from the the uh, universities, you're going to have to have that pressure coming from the, the VSO organizations. You're going to need to have that pressure coming from the American Medical, so uh, Medical Association and other types of medical associations that are going to push for the legalization. Now, that's going to take time because they got to figure out how they're going to do it, what they're going to do, what does it look like. Everybody out there who's doing all the activist work, you keep doing exactly what you're doing, right? Yeah. Uh, make sure that you just have a plan. You know what you're, you know. You know what you're going to look like when you're doing it and it, you make it effective. You yeah. know, it doesn't matter if you're, you're on the street corner holding a sign saying legalize it or if you're uh, bringing people together to sign a petition to get it decriminalized in your own city like they're doing in Dallas right now. 
So as we wind up, um, is there um, is there anything that you like would want to pull? put as a call out to anyone, things that your organization needs or that you're looking for or people. Who well, can... if you're a corporation that looks for a good organization about cannabis that, you know, talks that you want to find an organization that you can donate to for 501c3 to write off things of nature, definitely get a contact with me. If you're a vet that wants to uh, know more about us, follow us on, on IG at official hemp for victory. And uh, also on um, uh, Twitter or X, at, at official hint for victory so okay. we use those to get get the word out um, always down to do more podcasts i love talking about this subject i like talking with people about this subject most people just don't uh, i don't know that uh the veteran population in the community is strongly in support of this and are starting to get uh our patience is running thin mm -hmm. yes it's running thin and we're starting to collect a lot of the VSOs are starting to come together and unify our voice over this because uh, this is an issue that has long time been ignored and we're just losing way too many guys. And now we're on the target of the war. How are you guys doing?